Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. Welcome, everyone, back to Your Creativity, a creativity podcast exploring people's uh, different backgrounds and what makes them tick. Um, this week, we've got Darren Tufts. He's a writer, director, and producer. Most recently, he did um, My Girlfriend's Boyfriend and is currently in post-production for We Love You, Sally Carmichael. How are you today, Darren? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Before we jump into the interview questions with Darren, we're going to do some announcements. We are happy to announce that we have co-hosts now. Woo woo! And there's one of them, Steve Hatch. Woo um, woo! <laughs> he, you know, owns his own chocolate shop downtown, Hatch Family Chocolates, and he was also um, part of the TLC series, The Little Chocolatiers. How are you, Steve? I'm doing good, but let's just be honest. I'm way out there on creativity, so. I'm very appropriate for this gig. You'll be the straight man? Yeah, and some days I might bring chocolate. I'm going to bring chocolate, and I'll do all kinds of stuff. You didn't bring Ex chocolate today? I said someday. Oh, someday. Okay. Man, this when is... When you have a guest worth bringing chocolate for, well, you'll bring chocolate. I'm new to this, Darren. Cut me some slack. I haven't done this yet. Neither have I. Okay, good. We're on the same page. Um, the other night, you had an event at the, the shop. Yeah. The Do you know, we're always having different events, but we have outdoor movies. So someday we'll still want to Darren's movies and we can actually show we, we do outdoor movies. And so we actually put a big inflatable screen on our roof and we have a live band that will play music um, and we do an outdoor movie. They're kind of fun. And it was Sean the Sheep was this last one. Correct? Yeah, Sean the Sheep was Friday. And then upcoming we've got... Um, Star Wars, uh, The Force Awakens. We Weekends. have a plethora of movies coming up, Dylan. A plethora? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the easiest, honestly. Okay, yeah, and watch my, my language viewers or listeners because I'm going to, you're going to have to watch yours out. But yeah, honestly, we have all kinds of crap going on all the time. And um, yeah, we have a bunch of movies coming up. We'll, we'll blow your minds. Okay, excellent. And then Andrea is our other one. She was our guest on our second episode. She... Was, uh, is the creator and star and producer of the You Again web series. Um, they've had two episodes drop um, already, and they're getting a great response. So she should be back next time. She had a last-minute shoot come up t today, so that's why she's not here. So you're going to get, like, the real easy questions because, like, <laughs> she's the tough questioner. She's the hard-hitting interviewer, and you're more like, so what's your favorite ice cream? Yeah, and like, so that's a pretty cool shirt you have on. Maybe you could describe that for describe us. Describe that for our viewers. I see that it's blue. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the, those are my kind of questions. Oh, good, good. This that's is exactly be, yeah. what, yeah, that's why Dylan so this asked is gonna me be to be fascinating. on. fascinating. This is going to be a really interesting podcast. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. <laughs> Mind-blowing. Harley wait. Um, for the listeners that don't know who you are, Darren, then describe what you do. Uh, well, I am a writer, uh, and I've um, written a lot of uh, advertising. That's what I do primarily. I've also um, written a number of screenplays, and I've done uh, acting in local films and uh, some local TV and some producing and some directing. And, yeah, uh, that's me. That's very brief, I know. Yeah, very yeah. brief. But we'll, <laughs> we'll get into some more of the stuff as we, we go on here. Now, how did you get to, you know, where you are today from, like, you know, high school or, you know, before oh, high gosh, school? Oh, gosh, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's been a long time since high school. That's a, that's a long story. Yeah, me too. I, uh, I, I, uh, I went to high school. I grew up in Southern California, and then I came to Utah to attend BYU. And I graduated from BYU in 1998. Maybe I shouldn't have said the year. It really, really dates me. Um, and uh, I got my bachelor's degree in marketing communications, which is sort of a fancy term for uh, advertising. I became a copywriter, you know, which is to say – I, uh, a writer of advertising. And that's, that's always been, uh, primarily my, my career. You know, I, like I said, I graduated in 1998. So that was before the digital, you know, boom. I mean, I, I didn't even, I, I look back on how media has changed over the years since I got started. I didn't send my, or receive my first email 
until I was in college, you know, which is to show like, and, and that means that's sort of at the beginning when the internet was really, I mean, that's my, that was my first email, you know, so there was a, there was a long build from there. And, and so the idea of working in digital film or, you know, working with stuff on the internet was just completely, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't around yet. Um, and so that, that idea wasn't even, you know, realistic. So while I always loved film and would have lo- loved the idea of writing, uh, writing movies, it just, it just didn't seem realistic because I was pretty sure I was going to live in Utah. I was going to college in Utah. And, you know, it just didn't seem like I would ever move to Hollywood or really pursue that full time. Um, and so I focused on copywriting, which has been a, a really wonderful career. I really enjoy it and uh, still do that full time. And then, you know, all the other kind of show business stuff is stuff I do uh, in connection with it. Wow. Now, now with some of that local stuff, you work, um, I think you've worked with some friends of mine over at, uh, at Creative Media Group down in yeah, oh, yeah. Provo. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's right. I work with Creative. I mean, I've been working with uh, CMG, see so yeah, how that's how you know I know because I know that <laughs> cool little acronym CMG. Uh, Creative Media Group is owned by a man named John Farr, and he is um, he's 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 an excellent uh, he's an excellent cinematographer, and he's he 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 had hired he hired me as a freelance copywriter many years ago. I mean, probably over a, you know ten, twelve years or so longer you know, ago. So I've been you know working with him for a long time, and now. Uh, I own a little boutique advertising agency with a, with uh, with my partner, who's named uh, David Nibley, who's also done a lot of a lot of local film work and acting as well. And he uh, um, he's had a great relationship. So so we do we do a lot of stuff with with CMG, and yeah, they're 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 they're, uh, they're great. We really like them. Yeah, I, I when um, they were doing um, stock footage quite a bit, mm-hmm. I was yeah. I was helping out with that. They have amazing stock footage. Yeah. they really have extraordinary stock footage. We 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 pull for them all the time, but they have things that just blow me away. Yeah, it's it's amazing the footage I've seen yeah. trips all yeah, over. Yeah, really it's, something. It's great, Darren. You, I mean, you talked a lot about whatever, and Dylan's probably going to ask like more specific. Do you remember the first? What What did you first write? What was your first film? Do you remember when or your first story that you created for a film? For a film, yeah. You know, the the first time I wrote a screenplay, it was really kind of just an exercise to see if I could do it. I mean, I I you know I didn't study film. Uh, I I my minor was in was in uh, creative writing. Um, uh, you know, and I like I said I would have loved to have have pursued a career in that, but I didn't really know how. And I um I I wrote the first thing I wrote uh, after college. I thought I would try to write a novel, and I actually wrote. Um, an LDS uh, young adult fiction, kind of like science fiction novel, kind of a, you know, so, something I thought would be, it was based on a short story I wrote in college. And I thought, I thought it'd be a good exercise to see if I could turn it into a novel. And it was a, it was a short novel, but I thought if I write something, I want to write something in the LDS market again, this is way before the, the LDS cinema boom that happened and, you know, all those years ago. And I, I just kind of wrote it as an exercise and I actually kind of liked it, kind of didn't like it, you know, but I, part of that process for me was to see if I could adapt it into a screenplay, which I did after that. And, uh, yeah, I never pursued doing anything with that screenplay, but that was, I want to see if I could, you know, want to see if I could actually write a movie beginning, middle and end and see if it all worked and had, had an internal logic and had themes and had all the things you, you want to get out of that. And that was, so that so was the first thing I actually tried my hand at writing, uh, for, for film, but I never, you know, I, it's sitting in a box somewhere and it's so like mid twenties you were, mid- yeah, I was probably, let's see, I think I was uh, 25 when I graduated from college. So, so this was, this was probably around 26 or so I would say. So when I'm focusing on like the Burger King combos and which one to get, you were doing very productive things, like I, uh, writing screenplays. I was tr- well. I was writing a script. I was trying to. I mean, you know, I mean, it's <laughs> you know, I, I I don't know if writing it is the impressive part as far as you know getting something made. But, you know, is <laughs> is the much bigger accomplishment. But but uh, and actually, I, I don't even really fully believe that because I've always I've always felt like. Um, you know, the, I mean, one of the great things about writing is the only thing that qualifies you as a writer really is if you write something. You know, if you can show someone a piece of paper and say, here, I wrote this. That's really the only identifier, you know, as opposed to, say, actors who you can talk to an actor and it can be very difficult to understand. Like, OK, so, oh, you're an actor. So, you know, I'm just, you know, what have you done? And it's, you know, with um, it's it's much more nebulous uh, when you're first starting out. But if you're a writer, it's sort of, oh, you're a writer. What have you done? And you can either show them a stack of papers or you can't. And that seems to be the difference between if you're really a writer or not. And I've always, I, I, that kept me going a lot because I felt like, well, if I'm writing things, I'm probably already separating myself from a lot of people who say they're writers. If I'm actually completing things, even if nothing happens to them, I can say, look, I, 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 I can claim I'm a writer. I felt like a fraud when I first started out because it sounds like this weird, oh, you're a writer. What does that even mean? So I, I felt <laughs> like, well, as long as I can show people I'm writing things, I can justify that title. And that's kind of how it started. Writing's on my list of things I, I would like to do better. You know, I I try, I can't, but 
Um, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> <laughs> Writing's good, but I, you know, I need a lot of autocorrect. Oh, I need tons of, I don't even worry about the autocorrect very much because I feel like anything that, if you have a flow, you know, this is the great, like, again, this is the great thing about living in the digital era is you don't even have to be able to type. You can just <laughs> sit down and spit it all out, then sort it out later. You don't have to actually have penmanship or a typewriter where you have to go in and fix the mistakes manually. You can just autocorrect anything you need. Just the, keep writing. Yeah, the technology. <laughs> yep. Um, what, what type of conditions are you most creative in? Uh, I am, uh, you know, it depends what I'm doing. If if I'm writing, I I absolutely have to write in a vacuum. Like, I'm, I'm not capable of doing it otherwise. I have to be in a room with no noise whatsoever and, uh, and just, you know, sitting in front of a, a computer screen. I, I hate writing manually because it's just it's it, it's just very tedious. And the faster I can go, the better for me. But I'm not one of these people who can multitask. I'm either have to, you know, I have to be alone in a room and write or I'm not or I'm not writing at all. My brain can't handle any other function at the same time. But that being said, I mean as far as just general creativity, there's there's really almost nothing better than sitting down with a room with somebody who has you, you know, who you just really get and that person gets you, you know, just somebody you, you know, every, everything I've ever written. Uh, I'm sh- I'm sure at some point there have been people I'd sat down and just sort of brainstormed with and, you know, having somebody, not only somebody creative and intelligent, but somebody who you really connect with, you know, somebody who just, you guys really kind of, you guys are girls or whatever, really kind of get each other and get, you're sort of on the same page with things. That's, it's amazing what, what can come up with just one other good person that you're, you know, going back and forth with. It's always great to have that other person too, because they think of things that you don't always Absolutely. think of and it can just, you know, tie it together. Many of the best things I've written were totally things that other people, other ideas other people had. Absolutely. Yes. Who has inspired you most and why? Who has inspired me most and why? Oh my goodness. That's a great question. Um, who has inspired <laughs> me most and why? I don't know. Are you thinking about, I mean, are you thinking of peers or just people that I, you know, grew up reading and. Uh, creatively or just, you know, in general? You know, I, um, uh, I loved, I remember I, I grew up reading a lot of Stephen King and he wrote a, he wrote a nonfiction book on the craft of writing called On Writing a while ago. And I, I, it feels like every time I talk to somebody who's written, who's read that book, they love it as much as I do. But, you know, King is known for being really, he, he's not known for being brief. You know, he writes these big, long novels in a, and this this book was very very short, and he said it's because people for a long time have been trying to get him to write a book on the craft of writing, and he feels like he doesn't have anything to to really you know say because he feels like well you either write or you don't. So he said I'm going to try to keep this book as you know like junk free as possible, you know as BS free as possible, and just tell you what I you know what I know, which is basically a lot of autobiographical stuff. But there was this constant theme of. Um, he just, he's a guy who just writes. He just writes and writes and writes. You know, the guy got into a major car accident that almost killed him and was bedridden for like a year or something. And he wrote an 800 page novel by hand. You know, that guy just writes and writes and writes. And he, and, and he had a lot of really good practical advice for it. And I, um, I find that very inspiring because, because I, I, you know, people who just produce in that level, like it seems like that guy doesn't know how not to write, which is not something I identify with. And it's, it, and that's, that's always really inspired me. I, I, um, I, I always, uh, I, I've always been fascinated by by the movies of Woody Allen, not only because I like many of them, but because I'm fascinated by the fact that this is a guy who just writes and directs a movie every year. Yeah. And he just does <laughs> whatever he wants. And, you know, he's he's given interviews where he said, I don't do whatever I want because he has a he has a limited budget. But within that limited budget, he can do pretty much whatever he wants. And so he, you know, he wraps a movie and he picks an idea of his own and he writes it. And he makes it and he doesn't focus group it. You know, he has the autonomy to say if it's for a certain amount of money, I can just put it out there. And his movies, some make money and some don't. But over time, they make money. So he's a solid investment. And it just seems like that's would just, you know, and he's not much of a director, in my opinion. He's a writer, you know, so he kind of just directs yeah. his movies the way he wants to. But he's not this real visual artist. And, and uh, I, I, I mean, that would be a dream career to just be able to. Once a year, you write and direct whatever you want, and then the next year, you do it again. It just seems, I would love that. It, you know, looking over everything, you probably have projects that a you're like most proud of, um, and then maybe b you're not so proud of, or that you've made <laughs> some mistakes. But maybe combining those two, what, what what are the things that you're most proud of, or the projects that you've been a part of, or the stories that you've been um, most proud of? And yeah. then maybe even transitioning from that, like what are some of the biggest challenges or the biggest, I don't know, 
mess ups that you've had? And did that contribute to where you are now? Oh, I mean, I, for sure, everything I've ever done that has been produced, I don't think there's anything, and I don't mean this to be modest at all. I honestly don't think there's anything that I don't look at and and see major flaws or things I w- mistakes I made or things I wish would have gone differently. You know, um, uh, and and a lot of times you have to collaborate, and you know the collaborations are you know the very nature of it is that it's not just you. So sometimes I'll have differences of opinions on things I've worked. I've been a part of that. I feel like, well, I wouldn't have made that choice and I wish they would have made a different choice, but anyway, who's to say I'm right. Um, the things, I mean, a couple things stand out. You know, I, I was very, uh, I really liked making, um, I wrote and directed a movie called my girlfriend's boyfriend. And that was really fun. It was the first feature film I'd ever directed. And I was directing a movie from a script I wrote, you know, and it was very, uh, I, you know, it was Woody Allen esque in the sense that it was just a small story about a few characters, you know, and it, and I, I wanted to, make something that had sort of a, um, a different twist on a genre that I, had, I hadn't seen before. And, and I just wrote that, you know, over the course of about of a month or so, just in my, you know, you know, in my apartment in Provo at the time. And, and did, you know, I mean, nobody was paying me for it. Nobody was telling me I should do it other than a couple of friends I shared it with. And, you know, so, so it really had a sense of it being my baby. And I, I look at the movie that turned out and it, uh, you know, it has, gigantic things I wish I could change that, you know, that I think um, could have been done better, could have been written better, could have been directed better. But then there, but then I, I just, I just love it because it was my little baby that I, you know, created from start to finish. We had some wonderful actors, uh, you know, come on board with it. Um, Rick McFarland, who's a local, uh, uh, a local uh, filmmaker and producer, um, uh, you know, produced it with me. And it was, yeah, it was, you know, I was, so, so I was very happy with that. Um, and I mean, I've been involved with a lot of things that, I've been really fortunate to be involved in my, the first screenplay I ever wrote that I wrote, you know, that wasn't something I was just sort of contributing to, um, was a movie called stalking Santa. And, uh, you know, and I acted in it and it was, again, I acted in it with some extraordinary, uh, actors, uh, good friends of mine, Chris and Lisa Clark were, were both in it and a lot of other people as well. It was directed by a phenomenal director named Greg Kiefer who lives here in, um, Salt Lake and he runs a company called cosmic pictures and they produce the film and, you know, and, and I mean, I, we got to work with William Shatner on it. I mean, that was, that was part of the fun too. Some of these projects I've got to work with people that I really liked, you know, for a long time. We got to work with William Shatner on that with my girlfriend's boyfriend. I worked with Phyllis Milano, who had a crush on when I was a little kid. I mean, it's just fun sort of I think thinking. We all did. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just weird thinking here I am all these, you know, years later of being a film buff, uh, my whole life just, you know, it's just, it's just so fun to think, well, I'm actually somehow, somehow we're making these things. It's really you know, it, it's it's really crazy. The the first movie I, I had ever, I, I the first movie I acted in, I don't really, I gave up acting long ago, but the first movie I acted in was um, a movie called The Singles Ward, and that was directed by Kurt Hale, um, produced by Dave Hunter. And that was really, I mean, that was a really fun experience because I had never been really on a movie set, uh, you know, ha- had a part in a movie, you know, I'd, I'd never been in that world before. And here, the, here are some people were kind of created the sandbox and, and it just, you know, it was a low budget movie. They were, they were making this Mormon comedy, which seemed weird and something that seemed kind of different. And I didn't know if it would actually amount to anything. And, you know, so there's, I don't know, a lot, a lot of really fun, you know, and, and that led, I mean, that, that was a kind of a starting point for me, sort of thinking about what I wanted to do, what I could learn from, you know, the things, you know, that I was, you know, from the experiences I was having, you know, on these projects that were not my own, you know, it's just, yeah, it seemed to have rambled very far away from your, probably your first question, but there, there you go. No, but I think you answered it. <laughs> uh, speaking of Shatner, what was his, uh, he, he did the narration yeah. of that, that film. What, what was it like, you know, in those recording sessions? It was, I mean, it was really cool. It was, uh, we, we, hit, we made the movie and not intending to go after anybody famous. We made this movie with local actors and I had written it in such a way that the narrator would play a huge part in it. You know, it was just going to be, and I, it was sort of a, a riff on those old sort of, you know, pseudo documentaries like in search of, or those crazy documentaries I watched growing up, like, you know, where they go try to find Bigfoot or try to find aliens and these people have found Bigfoot. So we're going to go investigate. And then they build this whole thing up at the end. It's like, Oh, we didn't find him, you know? And, oh, you know? Um, and it, so it sort of, it sort of modeled itself after that. So the narrator would have been huge. And we, uh, when Excel entertainment was distributing the film, uh, Randy Davis actually, uh, who was the head of Excel at the time had the idea, well, you have this huge role for our narrator. Why don't you offer that, offer that to a famous voice? And he had me make a list. He said, give me, you know, your, the list of who you could have, if you could have anyone, I try to think more <laughs> realistically, because obviously if anyone, you know, Hey, let's go offer it to Tom Hanks. <laughs> like, but, but, uh, but I, th- I thought William Shatner creatively just really was funny to me for it. And I, 
a huge Star Trek fan. And so, you know, so we offered it to him. He said yes. And it was very quick. We went down to L.A. He was shooting Boston Legal all day. And he came over uh, when he was done to the studio in L.A. and just did the whole movie that, you know, that afternoon. And he was, uh, he was great. He came in. And he was, you know, he was, you know, it was, it was kind of a whirlwind, you know, he came in and we chatted and we had a good time and we got to work and he was so good so quick because the guy's got, you know, the guy's great, has so much experience. And he, he was like, you know, he, he knew how to be William Shatner. He knew that that's what we were looking for. And he, he, you know, and that we wanted him to have a little bit of fun with that. And he, you know, that's kind of a, that was a very sort of, um, uh, intimidating thing because I, we walk in there and when we're first talking to him, we say, I, we didn't want it to be big or over the top. So he said, why don't we just play it pretty, pretty straight. And he came in and he did it really straight and it was really, really good, but it wasn't William Shatnery, you know, it wasn't, didn't have that <laughs> panache that Shatner has. And, and I didn't, I, you know, I don't think any of us knew how to say, <laughs> Be Shatner. Be, be Shatner. You know, we didn't like dare say that. We eat said, well, a Snickers bar. Eat a Snickers yeah, bar. Yeah. happening to well, you. Well, he was game. That was the thing. We just didn't really know how to ask. We said, well, what? I mean, maybe a little, you know, and he kind of said, I think I know what you're looking for. You know, and he, and he came in there and Santa Claus. And he just kind of turned on this Shatnery <laughs> thing and it was just beautiful from then on out. So yeah, he was really, he was, he was really cool. He was really fun. But I, I, you know, that was, I, that was, we only, my, you know, experiences with him on that movie lasted probably four hours, four hours total. That's incredible. It's all in one one afternoon. Yeah. Wow. Recently, you've been um, Thermwise uh, character spokesman. Yeah. How did that come about? And that was uh, so. Th- yeah, that was a real. I feel like I really kind of fell into that in a very positive way. It's it's, it's an amazing job, and Questar is this, is an incredible company. I, I I had no idea I was getting into that. Um, at the time, that was probably nine years ag- or so ago. It's been a while. Oh wow. Um, that was a, an advertising campaign that was developed by a, an agency here in Salt Lake uh, named Richter Seven. They're a really great agency. They've you know a very big, successful agency here, and they um, so they they were coming up with this campaign for Questar, the Thermwise campaign. Um, uh, the the head of the agency's name is uh, uh, Dave Newbold, and he is the one who came up for the came up with this idea. And he called me and said, you know, I have this idea for a character, and I think you'd be great for it, but I have to have a, an audition. You know, so I, I can't just, you know, kind of put you in front of the client and say, here's what I want. We have to go through the whole thing. But he wanted to give me some insight. So going into it, I'd be really prepared. And I, I had produced and hosted a couple of short documentaries called um, American Mormon, basically just man on the street documentaries. Where I went. The first one, um, uh, my producing partner, um, who was also in the documentary, Jed Knudsen, and I, um, you know, we went around the country and just talked to people on camera and found out what they knew or didn't know about the Mormons and, you know, uh, just sort of a humorous look at some of the misconceptions. We went to like New York and DC and New Orleans and Las Vegas and just kind of went to all those iconic backdrops. And it was the first thing I'd actually produced that was a, you know, my products, like a product that I had produced. Um, and it was sort of an experiment, you know, in that marketplace. Um, and, uh, you know, and, uh, I had done a lot of, um, a lot of sketch and improv comedy. I was on a comedy troupe at BYU called the Garens. Um, many years ago. And then, uh, I was part of, uh, Provo comedy sports and, um, um, and you know, he knew about all this and he thought you could be really, you know, you might be really, you know, I think it was based on those experiences that, that convinced him I'd be the right guy for this. Um, so it kind of gave me the inside track and I went through the auditions and there were, you know, a lot of really awesome local actors, um, uh, uh at that audition. I just, I, I feel like I kind of had the inside track. So I went in and Gave it my best, and I thought, oh, this will be cool. This will be a campaign. It could run maybe a year or something. I didn't know it would be so, you know, so big. It would be such a big campaign, and it's um, it's it's a great program. It's helped a lot of people in Utah, so it's been this awesome thing because I'll walk around and people say, hey, I got my rebate check. Hey, Therm, thanks for the money, and it's this, you know. Yeah, I saw you, know, I saw you at a f- few home shows. Oh, yeah, yeah. I go to, the, <laughs> I, I go to a lot of home shows. Well, yeah. And what is your gas meter set at? So I mean, are you conserving? Or are you doing? We are, good? we are trying to conserve. We just uh, we, we. Where are you in the summer on the thermostat? We're so we're currently figuring that we're we're uh, we are in uh, my family. We are in our first summer in in a, in a home we bought last November. So we're still kind of figuring it out. We actually just put up new high efficiency triple pane windows all throughout the the main floor. So we're definitely we're definitely and we got a Quest our rebate that was that was really awesome because I had gotten um got that Quest our rebate check and. 
I, you know, open the envelope and there's, there's the check and it's got my, it's got my picture on it. I thought <laughs> that's a nice touch. You get a rebate and they put your picture on it. That's really cool. You know, and I went to the bank drive through and I, I deposited it and I, I'd forgotten by that point that my face was on it and the guy noticed. I, I would have went into the bank. <laughs> <laughs> he said, when he may, he may notice, I just have to point out that this might be the first time somebody deposited a check with their, with their picture on it. So that's, that's, you, know. <laughs> you did keep a copy of that check, right? I, you know, I mean, this, this is, I mean, Questar has put my face on so many things at this point. Sharon, come on, I know, that's pretty you, amazing. Well, I mean, I mean, there's, there's, there has been therm. There's, I mean, I think I have therm chapstick in my pocket. There's just <laughs> therm every. They had a therm sewing kit. <laughs> so I, I don't have everything they've ever put put therm wise on my face on. But uh, no, yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't make a copy of the check. No, I didn't. Keep that. <laughs> and there's probably an army of standees. Somewhere there are. I think a lot of them in the Questar building. People have told me they get it's you know like a Questar employee will run into me and they'll have sort of a flash because they're used to seeing a standee. Like, hey, there's the three dimensional taller version of that standee. <laughs> Joining in for family portraits. That's the first thing I get. That's 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 the comment I get most often with that campaign is, uh, and I get it. I mean, almost every day somebody says you are so much taller. I'm six foot seven, so I guess nobody you know could guesses that from. From the commercials, I was like, "Wow, you're so much taller than I thought." And I, so I, I had to come up with my <laughs> kind of my packaged, you know, quippy response back. You know, so I just have it ready because I never knew what to say. So they say, "Wow, you're so much taller in real life than on TV." And I, I, uh, so I'll say, "Well, how big's your TV?" But you know, <laughs> TV can't be this tall. I mean, it's probably maybe they need to upgrade. <laughs> yeah, I need a seven foot TV. Well, the final question I have is about uh, Sally Carmichael. Before we um, do that, I want to run through the filmography. All right, yeah, let's run that, through the filmography that, that we haven't that we haven't touched. You mentioned uh, Singles Ward. That yeah. was your first one as an actor, and then the RM. Yes, was after that. I think I have yeah a couple couple words in the RM. Very big role. I think I have a. Uh... Oh, come on. I think that's my line in the RM. <laughs> you nailed it. Oh, no, look, I just did it perfectly. Perfect read. The, the thing that bugged me about this, too, is they didn't tie together, and I think they could have done it That's easily. That was a big That was a big thing at the time, and I wonder, yeah, I don't know, because they, you know, they made the singles word, yeah. for those listening who don't know what we're talking about, right? Right. And Kurt wanted to bring back a lot of the same cast for the next movie, and of course, directors do that all the time, but something about the fact that that movie the singles word was so unique in that like marketplace that I think people felt like when they saw a trailer with all, with a lot of the same actors, they felt like, Oh cool. It's a sequel. And in the, and in the singles ward, the character that Kirby Hayborn plays goes on a mission and comes back. And then in the RM, of course (laughs) he's the RM. So everyone thought, yeah, I could see the confusion, but it Kurt always felt like, well, geez, directors do that all the time. And you know, nobody's confused. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder if he would have, if it would have been better to do something like that. I don't know. It, it wouldn't have been difficult at all to. I worked on. Think, I helped yeah. Kurt. Kurt had a. You know, he's he when he um, the uh the the guy who wrote the singles word and and the RM uh is named John Moyer and Kurt always was very uh, he he would co-write the script and he would I think he would open up to a lot of feedback from a lot of people and I I'd contributed several things to the RM script that I think a lot of people had and I you know, and that was that was a question all through like who's from the singles we're going to play parts and is that going to be confusing and. Yeah, I don't know. I it was always a big question. I don't know what the right answer is. I wonder if it would have been better to to do that. That, that was just my <laughs> personal. Observation. But yeah, I mean, I, I've heard that so many times. That's why. That's why I wonder. No, these next couple I have not. I don't think I've seen, or if I did, I don't remember them. Home teachers. You're probably uh, yeah. You're probably better off. Not. <laughs> See, I'm pretty much on the on the list of those people have that they're them? looking for. The mm-hmm. home teachers are looking for. I, I'm on the list of the other people that they're out trying to find. Usually I'm eating chocolate, so they never find me at my right, house. Right, that, That's where I would be. Um, I've seen a, some of these films, yeah. Have you? Yeah. All right, yeah. I've seen all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Home teachers, again, like I had, I was in one scene. I was, uh, you know, just like an el- elders quorum teacher, and it just kind of, just for fun, like I was in singles ward, so Kurt would always have me, he'd always have me back. He would say, oh, why don't you do, come in, do a, do this little character in this movie. And these Kurt, Kurt's a really, I mean, everyone knows Kurt knows he's a really, really nice guy. Uh, church ball. Church ball. Now, your credit said Polynesian, the Polynesian team. Yeah, all these. I mean, I don't even <laughs> think I have a line in that one. That's just, uh, again, like Kurt would have me come back. <laughs> did you make a basket? I did make a basket. I think I make a basket on screen. It's a, you know, a layup. Um, the joke Kurt had for that, I was 6'7". 
I, you know, which I still am, but I was also much skinnier back then too. I was really, really skinny. So, so Kurt thought, oh, they're going to play the Polynesian team and the Polynesian team is just going to dominate them. It'd be really funny if there was a tall, white, skinny guy on the Polynesian team. Um, you know, like a guy who marries a Paul, he had a whole backstory for it. He married a Polynesian woman and now he's in the Polynesian ward. And so he's on the Polynesian team. And, and, and when we got there, he said, you should, you should all play it so that like none of you like him. You know, so like he's kind of trying to get in the huddle and everybody just sort of all these big Polynesian guys are blocking you out. And he's all right, high five, high five guys. And they're just kind of rolling their eyes. And I don't know if any of that really comes through. You know, it's just just I think it's just more of there's this big, tall, skinny white guy on the Polynesian team in the movie. And it, <laughs> uh, we talked about the American Mormon movies, the mm-hmm. kind of yeah. men on the street, uh, stalking Santa. Um, uh, boyfriend's girlfriend. Is there anything you want to? else you want to mention about that one no i mean just i mean that that was uh that's really connected to we love you sally carmichael in the sense that um i wanted to make another movie that was uh similar you know it was kind of in the same vein and my original thought was if 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 anyone did care like oh written and directed by the person who wrote and directed my girlfriend's boyfriend this might be right up your alley i thought let's make a movie kind of like that so that was that had a big influence on 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 sally carmichael but uh, but yeah no i mean uh i I don't know what else to say. All right. Uh, inside. This inside, one's kind of yeah. different from the, the rest of your stuff. It's more of a, it's a prison drama. It's a, it's, yeah, well, it's a horror movie. Or, it's I, a, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I call it, yeah, not right. I mean, it's got some dramatic moments, I guess, but yeah, it's a little, it's a little micro budget kind of high concept horror movie. I mean, it just, it was, it was a little, it was very experimental for me. Uh, it was an idea about, um, the original idea was what if we, had a guy in a, in a, in a prison cell. I mean, I was thinking in terms of, tra- you know, I was really thinking in terms of, can I make a movie with a guy in a box? Like, is, can I make a really, really just low, low, low budget movie, a really micro budget movie, I guess they call it. And I thought, what if a guy was in a prison cell and there was something loose in the prison killing everybody and he hit, you know, and he doesn't know what's going on and, and, and he can hear, he can talk to people through the walls, but you know, there's something supernatural and there's a mystery unfolding in the prison and you know it turned into the, it turned into the movie inside um and so yeah it was it was definitely a departure for me it was something different i i don't know if i would try something like that again you know it wasn't really i, I don't think it's really suited to what i do <laughs> but but it was uh, but it was different it was fun you, you got to push yourself just like you did at the beginning you know with the novel in, yeah i mean that, the- that's the idea you know when you write and especially when you're trying to make movies um there's really something to be said for momentum if you're working on something and it's moving forward, you, you keep pushing it because you don't, you know, it's very hard to get momentum on a project. And uh, Inside had some good momentum. I wrote the script and it, you know, and and I, I had some good support for it and there were some people interested in it and we just kept pushing it and, until we made a little horror movie. Do the moods ever um, kind of mirror real life? So the scripts that you're writing, um, and do they mirror kind of what you're experiencing or feeling like going day to day? Do you ever notice that like in a time frame? Are totally unrelated, and yeah, you use some question. of those examples yeah. in the stories, but I, you know, not really. I will say I've definitely been really in like heavily influenced by things that I like at the time. Stalking Santa is is so obviously influenced by Christopher Guest movies that it's <laughs> that's you know it's all like almost too much. So you know, I could see that, and I you know at the time I I just loved Waiting for Guffman. I love all of his movies, but you know that was when I, I was, one of the best. Yeah, it was my favorite of all of them. I'd, I'd watch it over and over again, and you can knowing that if you're you know find that movie, you could definitely definitely probably see that. But yeah, not really the moods because I you know when I write, I write these characters, and they just sort of say and do whatever they're going to say and do, you know, so obviously it's, it's obviously it's, you know, it's, it's a reflection of my real life experiences because it, you know, everyone's would be, but I'm not really putting, I don't really put myself into any of them. That's there's um, there's a character in my girlfriend's boyfriend who got unwillingly famous because he, 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 uh, he won a prize. He bought a pack of gum and he, and he won a prize and he became a, he, 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 uh, the grand prize was you can be in a commercial for this gum and he ended up, and he was just this shy, introverted guy, and he did this commercial, and it became big. He was terrible at it, really shy and awkward and introverted. So it became this big, funny commercial, and they 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 played it tons and tons. He became famous for being the gum guy, and he ha- and he had no money. He had a lifetime supply of gum. That's all he had, and so he just he just hated this. This was his burden <laughs> everywhere he went. As people knew him as the gum guy, and I wrote this script way before um, I became Thermwise at Questar. But I get that. I've gotten that a lot. Like, oh, and from Questar too. Like, oh man, is it like you know? Is that how you feel? Like, do you feel like people bother you and you don't like doing this? Like, oh no, not at all. It was. It really was just 
totally a coincidence. It wasn't it? W- it was more of um, life imitating art than the other way around. <laughs> Random acts. That's that's a s- series on uh, BYT BYU TV. You yeah. did a few of those. Yeah, I mean, I ultimately I didn't have a lot to do with it. It was um, uh, Random Acts. Is uh, yeah, it's a really funny um, hidden camera. TV series, Will Rubio and Lisa Clark and Jacqueline Hales, so several friends might have been on camera for that. And they um, produced by Cosmic Pictures, the same company who produced uh, Stalking Santa. Um, I mean, the concept are, you know, nice hidden camera pranks. And I, I was part of that show in, a very, in its very beginning when it, um, when it, we were, you know, um, still brainstorming and trying out what it could be. There's actually, they created one pilot and then they created another one after, you know, after feedback from BYU. So I was involved in that. I came up with some of the gags, some of the things, but I, I wasn't substantially involved as the series rolled out, just kind of in, in the, in the beginning stage of it. Okay. Um, Sally Carmichael. Um, so that's, you, you wrote this and, um, yeah. Christopher Gorham, is that how you say his last yeah, name? Yeah, uh-huh. And he, he's directing. You worked with him in, um, uh, My Girlfriend's My Boyfriend. Girlfriend's yeah. Boyfriend. We've been yeah. talking so many of your movies, I want to make sure I said the right but one. See, anytime you talk about My Girlfriend's, or My Boyfriend's Girlfriend, I'm just thinking Alyssa Milano. You just, you just can't I mean, get past I'm kind of going back to that. Does she make an appearance in the new one? She she does not make an appearance in the new one. She uh, she could be like a mom or something. Yeah, that, well, she could there. be yeah, so many things. No, she, yeah, um, no, she's not in the new one. She was wonderful, <laughs> wonderful in uh, in my girlfriend's boyfriend. Great to work with, but she's not she's not in the new one. Uh, we have a phenomenal cast for this new one. I'm really excited about it, Chris. I, I I originally pitched the the movie to Chris. Chris played the male lead in My Girlfriend's Boyfriend, and we had stayed friends after uh, after meeting on that. And um, I thought, well, you know, we this movie was going to be made on a lower budget than My Girlfriend's Boyfriend. We couldn't afford any actors from Hollywood. And I thought, well, I know him. I'll kind of like you know talk about this movie I'm working on. He's going to get so excited. He's just gonna can't. He's going to not be able to help himself. We're wanting to be in it for free. And, and uh, I got more than I got more than I wished for because he, when I start telling about, it, he said, "What if I directed this movie?" And he was really, you know, interested in directing it. And long story short, he's, I mean, he's been a phenom- he done a phenomenal job, been a really, really great job. And I sort of, um, you know, cajoled him into saying, like, "Well, if you're going to be, if you're going to direct it, you need to be in it because I'm trying to, you know, trying to boost this movie's profile." And and uh, and you know, and I originally want you to be in it. So you know, he he attracted some other great talent to it and helped get the script out there. And we. Shot the whole thing in Utah. And he really he has a, he has a great following here, but he he loved the idea. It was fun, sort of bringing him up to speed on the local film culture, you know, and uh, uh, sort of you know the, the 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 recent history of LDS filmmaking and you know what that means and what that sort of you know led to and different opportunities for me as well as a lot of other people. And it's just you know it was, it was really fascinating to kind of bring him into this into this marketplace. And he 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 loved the idea of of making this movie. You know, with my girlfriend's boyfriend, we the movie just takes place in a city. We shot it in Salt Lake City, of course, but we don't really identify it as Salt Lake. There's a couple things you could tell, but you know, but we don't really, you know, we don't try to make it not seem like Salt Lake, but we don't, you know, we don't highlight that at all. Um, we don't call that out. And this movie said, let's make it Salt Lake City. Let's make it Utah for Utah. And the character will be, it has nothing to do with Mormons, you know, but the character happens to be a Mormon. That's what's interesting about it. Let's actually like, you know, rather than, it seems like whenever there's a there's a local movie made that the character's a Mormon, it, it's a movie, you know, of course, all about Mormons. And and more often than not, the ending is, aren't Mormons great? You know, you should be a Mormon too. Kind of seems to be, you know, sort of the open, sort of the mild theme of the movie. Um, and with Sally Carmichael, we said, why don't we just make it, make the character Mormon, just like any other movie that we actually hoped that would be progressive in the sense that it has, it has nothing to do with the movie. It just happens to be a Mormon character. So we can see that reflected in the character, but, but there's nothing about the church in the movie whatsoever, you know, and, um, and, uh, you know, other than the fact that his actions would be consistent with somebody who, you know, could be Mormon. Um, and so the local media in the movie is also local media. There's, there's a scene where he goes on a Mormon talk show. So we, he goes to good things, Utah and, you know, their uh, uh, radio from hell, uh, X 96, they were kind enough to play a scene in the movie as local, as a local radio morning show. And it's very cool. It's very cool to make a movie in Utah and actually know that this is a Utah movie. It's a movie that takes place in Utah. Steve has also been in some movies. I know you have, haven't you, Steve? Yeah, I've been in a few. <laughs> yeah, I've. Yeah, you Let, know, let's let's go over your filmography. Yeah. What have you been yeah. in? Troll, yeah. Troll let's too. not. Like, like I know. <laughs> were you in Troll Two? You were in Troll Two, weren't you? Yeah, I was. Oh, that is amazing. <laughs> but I was a punk kid, so I mean, for me, it was like I had no clue what was going on, and I was in a 
costume the whole time. So, but now you're in this so iconic, it didn't take acting you, skills. But you didn't know at the time that the phenomenon that movie would become. That's correct. So that's probably why you didn't enjoy it as much as you should have being on that set. I should have enjoyed I actually did enjoy every minute. Mm-hmm. I hung out with people from my high school and junior high, and um, that was the fun of it have for me. Have you done troll things? Like, have you gone to any conventions or anything? You know, I know I, I saw the documentary on it. Do you know what? I actually have not. I, I went to one. Um, my attention really has been a lot of our chocolate shop, and that's yeah. where my focus has been. Yeah. Um, and less of the others. And so I have not been a part of the troll twos as much as I should be. <laughs> it's funny. Um, I mean, there, there's, it's funny. The connections there, you know, the, uh, Connie from troll two was in single is, board. That's course. actually who I went to high school with. Oh, did you? So yeah. Connie was the person that called me up and said, Steve, they need little people come and join trolls too. Mm-hmm. So that's who I went with. And I would sit and talk with Connie all the time on set. That was my experience with Troll Two. I so. gotcha. I did. I I there is a um. Gosh, I'm blanking on his name. It's terrible. He was in a Thermwise commercial years ago, and he he was great. Um, and then later I saw the Troll Two documentary. I didn't know he was in Troll Two. I would have asked him a lot more questions had I had I known. <laughs> no, it's it was a great experience. But you know, for me, and it's probably the same with you. I I've had a very fortunate life, and I've done some amazing things. But if you were to take your life. And to put it in a nutshell, mm-hmm. what advice would you give to others out there that want to follow the same path that are sitting there in college or high school or trying to figure out what the hell to do with their lives and yeah. where they want to go next? What advice would you give to them? I I, I mean, it's it's I know it's cliche. I know but you wouldn't say hell. You would probably say heck. But well, what advice yeah, would you would give never to these say, people? I would only what, say heck. I would say what heck. What advice and, would you give to these gosh people? Darn. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's so cliche. I'd say just, just do it. Just really, really go for it because the worst thing that's going to happen if you try to pursue anything creatively, the worst thing that's going to happen is that you'll, you'll feel like you failed or you feel like you, you know, that, 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 I mean, that's the worst case scenario. And I feel like that's so much better than wondering if you could have succeeded, you know, if you just try something and, and, you know, and again, the worst case scenario, you're not going to really fail at anything you create because you'll have created something. You know, if you write a screenplay, you'll have written a screenplay. You know, if if you you know what you know whatever that thing is, if you pursue acting, you'll have you'll have you'll have done the things. You know, like you take the acting classes or get the job and whatever it is. Even if you don't make a career career out of it, so I would say really try it and risk failure because you know you're never going to be young younger than you are right now. You know, you're never you know you're less you know I mean you're <laughs> never going to have a better opportunity than you have right now as far as that goes. And I feel like when it comes to movies, the the gateway to get into filmmaking is so much broader and wider than it was when, you know, when I grew up, you know, again, like I grew up thinking it was before digital filmmaking it was before the internet. I mean, really anyone can make a movie now. I mean, that, that really is true. And I know that mentality has been around a long time. There are filmmakers like Roger, Robert Rodriguez and people who say, you just have to do it, just do it. However you can do it for $2,000, whatever, you know, whatever you're going to do to get it done. But now, I mean, you could, you can literally make a movie using cell phones. You can, upload that movie to YouTube. I mean, I mean, you know, there's, there's really no reason why you couldn't be. So I'd say if, if you, you know, if, if you think you might want to do something, whatever that is creatively, just, just do it, just try it, see how far it goes. It may, you know, you may, you may get some momentum. You may just keep, you may be able to do it for years and years and years. You don't know. Bill, and that's why I want to be a part of this is because yeah. you nailed it is, I mean, I think that I the, trying to be creative and that's the whole point of, just push Why it. I want to be you know, there. if you have something to say, you know, that's what it comes down to, right? Like creating anything, you know, it's music or acting or dance or whatever it is. Like you kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, you kind of have something to say, something you want to try and do. So, I mean, you might be good at it. You might be, you know, you might do something interesting. You don't, you don't really know until you do it, you know? And, and again, if you, if you, if, if, if you don't catch that momentum, then you can sleep at night saying, I gave it a shot. I tried it. I did it. I, you know, didn't work out, you know, fine. You know, I mean, I, I would much rather have that than the, than a feeling of, gosh, could, what what could have happened? What might have happened if only I had put the work in? If only I had at least tried it. That, that was a great question, Steve. I don't think I can top that. So we'll just um, close out the show. <laughs> um, Sally uh, Carmichael, uh, you're in post production. Do you We're have in- a rough? release date at this point you know uh not yet we're, we're thinking we're you know at this point we're thinking of a theatrical release um this spring spring 2017 
but it's too early to know for sure. We're, right. we're still putting together rough cut right now. We we are we're really um, we're excited about it. We 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 it's a it's a fun project and um, it's coming together nicely. There's an email list at lovesallymovie.com. You can sign up for an email list. We we'll be sending out things and announcements as we go along with that. But yeah, no, it'll probably sometime in 2017. Great. Darren, thank you. Thank you, guys. This thank is fun. You. Yeah, thank you for having me. No problem. You can catch our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher, and also on uh, earholemedia.com. Catch everybody next time, and have a great week. Woot, woot.